Well, they confirm that selective breeding for resistance isn't just theory, it's absolutely feasible. It means a good chunk of the variation we see why some fish get covered in lice and others don't is down to their genes. Right. And that variation, that natural diversity within the population, like the huge range in sea lice counts on salmon you sometimes see. That's the raw material for breeders. It's gold. Okay. Same with shrimp. When you see whole families consistently surviving better after a virus challenge, that points to a strong genetic basis for selection. A whole new era of communication in the global aquaculture industry is coming. Now you have the brightest minds in aquaculture right in your pocket. And what's best? You can listen to all of them while driving to a farm, traveling, or running errands. It's never been this good, and it's never been this simple. Welcome to the Aquaculture Podcast Show, the first AI-based podcast in aquaculture, where you'll find cutting-edge insights in everything that's working in aquaculture, nutrition, health, and production. Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today, we're zeroing in on something really critical, uh, something that's genuinely changing how we manage disease in aquaculture. It's all about using genetic technology. Right. Moving beyond just reacting. Exactly. Instead of just, you know, responding after an outbreak, the industry is looking at building disease resistance right into the fish and shrimp themselves. Mm -hmm. We're talking about huge challenges, things like sea lice and salmon or that really damaging white spot syndrome virus in shrimp. Devastating problems, yeah. And tackling them not just with treatments, but by boosting the animal's own natural ability to fight back. It feels very proactive, very uh, sustainable, especially for a sector growing so fast. Why Zenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads, we elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence, starting now. Okay, let's unpack this a bit. It really is a necessary shift. Mm -hmm. Think about the scale of aquaculture now over half the world's seafood. Yeah. That scale makes it, well, inherently vulnerable. Right. Big populations, big risk. Exactly. We're talking billions in losses every year. Yeah. Plus the animal welfare impact, the sustainability questions. Yeah. It all adds up. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, our, let's say, conventional tools, biosecurity, vaccines, treatments, they're important, but... They're not always enough. They're increasingly not enough. Pathogens evolve, you know, mm -hmm. they adapt. So we need something more fundamental, more durable. Yeah. And genetics offers that. That's what we're exploring today, these uh, cutting-edge genetic tools and what they mean for future resilience. Okay, so the core idea is improving host resistance. Basically, making the fish or shrimp better fighters themselves. Precisely. Yeah. Giving them a better internal toolkit. And the key, I suppose, is that this resistance can actually be inherited, passed down. That's the crucial part. We're seeing clear evidence for it. The heritability is there. For instance, with sea lice and Atlantic salmon, the estimates uh, range from around 0.14 up to 0.43. Okay. And for white spot and shrimp, maybe be lower, 0.01 to 0.31, but still significant. Mm -hmm. It shows there's a genetic component we can work with. So... What do those numbers, those heritability values, actually tell a breeding program? What's the practical implication? Well, they confirm that selective breeding for resistance isn't just theory. It's absolutely feasible. It means a good chunk of the variation we see why some fish get covered in lice and others don't is down to their genes. Right. And that variation, that natural diversity within the population, like the huge range in sea lice, counts on salmon you sometimes see. That's the raw material for breeders. It's gold. Okay. Same with shrimp. When you see whole families consistently surviving better after a virus challenge, that points to a strong genetic basis for selection. So you find the champs, the naturally resistant ones, and you breed from them. Sounds straightforward enough, but I suspect there's a catch. Are there trade-offs? Uh, yes. Biology rarely gives a free lunch, as you said. There often are trade-offs, these sort of negative correlations. Like what? Well, a classic example is in shrimp. Breeding for that white spot resistance. It's often negatively correlated with growth rate, sometimes quite strongly, like minus 0.55 to minus 0.64. Meaning the more resistant shrimp might grow slower. Exactly. And you see something similar, though maybe less pronounced, with sea lice resistance and growth in salmon, maybe around minus 0.32, to minus 0.37. Mm -hmm. So breeding programs can't just chase resistance blindly. They have to perform this... Uh, intricate balancing act, yeah. weighing resistance against growth, feed efficiency, other vital traits. It's optimizing the whole package, not sure. just one feature. Precisely. 
It's yeah. about maximizing the overall genetic merit for long-term success and sustainability, not just a single trait focus. That makes sense. So beyond just knowing resistance is heritable, mm -hmm. what do we know about how it works? What's happening biologically inside these resistant animals? That's where it gets really interesting looking at the mechanisms. They can be quite sophisticated. Take salmonids, for example. Okay. In species like coho or pink salmon, which are naturally pretty tough against lice, they mount this strong, fast skin inflammation. The skin thickens. Immune cells flood the area. Falling off the parasite. Hmm? Essentially, yes. They often encapsulate it, stop it feeding pretty quickly, maybe within 10 days or so. Yeah. Atlantic salmon, on the other hand, their genes react strongly, lots of activity there, but the physical defense isn't always as effective. Why not? Well, partly because the louse itself is clever. It secretes things that seem to dampen or misdirect the salmon's immune response. So the genetic differences between salmon species really highlight these key defense pathways. And in shrimp facing the white spot virus. Similar story, different players. The virus triggers the shrimp's main immune alert systems, uh, a pathway is often called TOL and IMD. This ramps up production of antimicrobial compounds, their internal defense molecules. Okay, so the alarm goes off, defenses deploy. But the virus fights back. Mm -hmm. It produces these tiny genetic molecules, microRNAs, that interfere with the signaling like cutting the alarm wires. And it even hijacks the shrimp's own cell metabolism to help itself replicate faster. Wow, yeah. it's a real molecular battle. Absolutely. And understanding these differences, how resistant animals succeed and where susceptible ones fail, is critical for figuring out how to intervene effectively. Which brings us to the really modern tools. We're clearly past just looking at visible traits over generations. What are these advanced genetic tools being used now? Right, we've entered an era of much higher resolution. Think uh, genome-wide scans. These let us scan the entire genetic code to find specific regions, tiny variations linked to resistance. Pinpointing the important genes. Or at least the important neighborhoods in the genome, yes. In salmon, we found specific chromosome areas linked to sea lice resistance. In shrimp, regions near known immune genes pop up for virus resistance. It gives us targets. Okay. Then there's what we call genomic selection. Instead of just a few markers, this uses thousands across the whole genome to predict an animal's genetic potential, its breeding value. More data, better predictions. Much better, especially for complex traits like disease resistance where lots of genes are involved. It really speeds up genetic gain in breeding programs compared to older methods. Interesting. What else? We're also getting incredibly detailed views with things like uh, a single cell analysis, looking at gene activity in individual immune cells in shrimp, for instance, to see exactly which cells do what. Wow. And spatial methods that map gene activity right at the infection site. Why does one salmon species wall off lice better? We can literally see which genes switch on where in the skin tissue. It's like getting a cellular level battle map. Incredible detail. And it doesn't stop there. Studying proteins helps us see how pathogens dodge immunity. We're even looking at, believe it or not, the chemicals in fish mucus. Some compounds seem to attract lice. So you could potentially breed fish that are less attractive to parasites. That's the idea. It's another angle. And finally, of course, there's direct gene editing. The really precise stuff. Exactly. Tools that let scientists make very specific changes to genes linked to resistance. It's still mostly experimental in aquaculture and obviously needs careful consideration and regulation. But early studies, like knocking out specific genes in salmon, are showing it can work to validate targets and potentially accelerate improvement dramatically. That's quite a toolkit. It sounds incredibly promising. But, you know, with powerful tech come challenges, how do we make sure these genetic gains last? Pathogens evolve too, right? Absolutely. Critical point. Pathogens do evolve, and intensive farming can sometimes accelerate that. It's like giving the pathogen lots of chances to adapt. So resistance could break down over time. It's a risk. That's why breeding programs need to be smart. They need to incorporate models of evolution, think long term, maybe rotate resistant lines to stay ahead. It's an ongoing process, not a one-shot fix. And what about managing these improved stocks? Any ecological considerations? Definitely. Responsible deployment is key good farm biosecurity, careful management to minimize any risk of interbreeding with wild populations, stewardship is vital. But the overall goal is clear. Use genetics to build more resilient animals, reduce reliance on chemicals or drugs, cut economic losses, and improve welfare. And these principles, they apply way beyond just sea lice and white spot. 
It's a platform for tackling many diseases. You might even get broader benefits, like reducing the overall pathogen load in the environment. Potentially, yes. Yeah. Kind of a herd immunity concept that could indirectly help wild stocks, too. It's all interconnected. So looking ahead, it really feels like a fundamental shift in how we approach aquaculture health. I think it is. Combining selective breeding with genomics, these omics tools, gene editing, it's transformative. The future really is a kind of genetic arms race where our science needs to constantly innovate to keep aquaculture healthy and sustainable. A race to stay ahead of evolving threats. Exactly. It's about securing the future of this incredibly important food sector, building that resilience in from the start at the genetic level. A really powerful idea. And it leaves us with a key question, doesn't it? As we deploy these incredible genetic tools, how do we ensure we're building systems that aren't just resistant today, but truly adaptable and robust for the long haul for generations to come. That's the challenge and the opportunity right there. Something important for all of us to think about. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to follow the Aquaculture Podcast Show on your favorite platform. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook to stay updated on the latest episodes and industry insights. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.